I'd like to call this meeting of the New Hanover County Board of Education to order. I'd ask everyone to please stand for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Gracious God, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather here tonight, the opportunity to discuss matters involving the children of New Hanover County. Guide and lead us as we make our decisions. May all our discussions be civil, and may they be enlightening. We're thankful for the other many blessings you have given us, the pleasure of living in this country where people can actually act and do as they think in their best interest. We pray for those who work to keep us safe, those serving in the military overseas and those serving here at home. We're thankful, too, for the others who help, help keep us safe, law enforcement, fire protection. May you watch over each one of them and grant them safety. And for those who are fighting for us overseas, be with their families, comfort them, and may they all be allowed to return home safely. This we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Christ that we all went to the brothel. You may be seated. First off, I want to thank the Wrightsboro Elementary School, the principal Lawrence Overby, instructor Shannon Flowers for our national anthem. Uh, has somebody got a microphone out there? Yeah, he's, he's got it. Okay, if you would give us your name and the grade you're in. My name is Xavier. I'm fifth grade. My name is Natalie and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Cammie and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Kayla and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Avian and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Betsyda and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Jada and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Twyla and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Melanie and I'm in fifth grade. Thank you. And then if we could get it over to the... Okay. Our, our uh, color guard was from the Naval Junior ROTC from Eugene Ashley High School, uh, Principal Patrick McCarty, Instructors Chief Thomas Frost, and Lieutenant uh, Colonel Robert Reeder. And if y'all would give us your name, uh, your grade, and your rank. My name is Cadet Lachance. Um, I'm a ninth grader, and I am a seaman recruit apprentice. Seaman apprentice recruit. I am Cadet Petty Officer, third class Congleton. I am a freshman at Eugene Ashley High School. I'm Cadet Seaman Recruit Dallas, and I'm a freshman at Eugene Ashley High School. I am Cadet Seaman Recruit Pyron from Ashley High School. Thank you. Ms. Adams, would you call the roll, please? Edward B. Higgins? Here. Jeanette S. Newland? Here. Janice H. Navinoff? Here. Lisa Isha? Here. John S. King? Here. Bruce C. Travis? Here. David L. Gordon? Here. Do you have before you the agenda, or is there any additions or deletions? <laughs> Mr. Superintendent? None on my part, sir. Anybody else? All right, do I hear a motion that we adopt this agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Next item, the approval of the minutes. Uh, they don't show what. I don't know. Okay, all right. Next item then is a public hearing on the proposed 2017-2018 budget. We have had no one to sign up for the public hearing. Uh, so I guess we'll move on to the next slide. All right, recognition of achievement. Uh, Ms. Quarterbaum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us this evening. Tonight we will begin our recognitions by highlighting one of our fabulous community partnerships that we have with the Landfall Foundation. Tonight we have Mr. Carl Roark, president of the Landfall Foundation, and Ms. Ginger Wilson, who is the co-chair of the Landfall Foundation Grants Committee. And they are here to share with us how the Landfall Foundation supports our students and our schools throughout the district. Mr. Roark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving us a few moments to share my personal passion, but a lot of other people's passion in landfall, and that is what we do for the New Hanover County school system. My colleague, Ginger Wilson, and I will tag team, as we used to say in the Midwest, and we will try to share with you what we have done over the past 22 years, but importantly, focusing on more recent times, which is more relevant to all of us. The Landfall Foundation has been in business, so to speak, 
for over 22 years. And during that time, we have supported nonprofit organizations in this area and public schools through grants for education, arts, health, and welfare. And the total amount that we've given over those 22 years is almost four and a half million dollars raised principally. Thank you. Raised principally, though not exclusively, within landfill, about 90 percent. Could I have the next slide? Oops. I'm technologically challenged. What can I tell you? <laughs> We're proud to partner with the New Hanover County School System, as you might imagine, to improve education for all of our students. Just last year, the New Hanover uh, County Schools received over $68,000 from the foundation for numerous projects, which Ms. Wilson will detail in just a few moments. The area high schools, we have uh, given grants supporting striving to achieve excellence, Poverty to College Pathway Project through college trips. We've aided in dropout prevention er efforts, which is very near and dear to my heart. And we've helped to fund clubs and competitions and assisted needy students in countless ways with graduation expenses just being one example. Now at this point, I get to get off this dais and give the easy part, to, or the hard part rather, to Ms. Wilson after I've accomplished the easy part. We'll hear more about the granularity of what we have done in the last years. Ginger? Um, in our middle schools in New Hanover County, um, the projects have included technology and STEAM learning opportunities with STEAM um, being science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Um, We've provided uniforms and emergency student needs, um, after school enrichment, and lots of much needed books for our libraries. Um, through Landfall Foundation funding, elementary schools have explored coding, they've expanded technology, and stimulated young readers with books. Schools have also, whoops, Purchase playground equipment, uniforms, emergency items for, to support the health and welfare of the students and their families. In addition to the grants that Landfall Foundation has provided directly to the schools, we've also supported New Hanover County Schools through grants to other community organizations. Um, the Landfall Foundation is the only local sponsor of the North Carolina Symphony Program for fourth graders, which includes a performance at the Wilson Center and classroom materials for the teachers and for the students. First and second graders attend an age-appropriate play presented by Pied Piper Theater through a grant to Historic Thalian Hall Center for the Performing Arts. The Landfall Foundation helps to fund kindergarten eye screenings through a grant to prevent blindness in C. Our most economically vulnerable students don't go hungry over the weekends and over school holidays thanks to a grant to nourish NC. Other community organizations such as the Thalian Association, the Cameron Art Museum, the Cape Fear Museum, and the North Carolina Jazz Festival provide enrichment opportunities for students. Other Landfall Foundation supported organizations such as the Assistance League, Cape Fear Guardian Ad Litem, Dreams of Wilmington, and Cape Fear Volunteer Center help to provide tutoring, mentoring, and help with the basic needs of our students. Grant applications for the 2018 cycle can be found on our website and are due June 1st. So for any teachers and principals um, in the audience, um, that's important information. Um, and this year, the grant process is entirely online. So there will be no standing in line at the post office, no making copies. It's, it's a much easier process. And the grants for this year will be awarded in November. Thank you, Ginger. 
you don't get away with, with a, uh, a free lunch here. Uh, there has to be a little bit of a pitch. Uh, the Landfall Foundation is completely run by volunteers. There are 25 board members and there are 16 or 18, I lose track, uh, of the uh, grants committee, uh, which is the most vital part of our organization. Those people all do everything you just heard and more gratis. The uh, sole support that we have is donations from individuals and community events that we put on. And these community events are about six per year. And the annual art show is coming up in April. And those of you that like art, it's a fantastic show. It's huge and it's very diverse. The Legends of Tennis. For anybody who likes to play tennis, this year we'll have Marty Fish as the principal headliner. Uh, plus competition between pros uh, here in Wilmington. Uh, so there's a little ego involvement for various uh, locations in Wilmington. In September, we have my personal second favorite, which is the Holiday Marketplace. I'm not a shopper. I can do all of my shopping for the holidays in one swell foop. It's easy, and it's a great organization to support. We hope that you'll support us by attending these events, any and all that you can. And we really do sincerely thank you for letting us partner with the New Hanover County Schools to help build our future through education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both again so much. And next I will ask Dr. Wellmers, the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, to join us as we recognize our National Board Certified Teachers. Dr. Wellmers. Mr. Chairman, it is our privilege tonight to recognize our National Board Certified Teachers. Our district continues to lead the state with a high number of these teachers, of nationally board certified teachers. And I want to say thank you to each of these teachers for your hard work and for all your dedication to the craft and what you bring today. This is an outstanding achievement. We basically have two groups that we're going to introduce tonight. One group has just earned uh, this achievement. The other group has renewed. They received it 10 years ago and they've been working hard to renew this. So if we could, I'd like to call your name. Please come forward, uh, be recognized and stay so we can take a group picture, all right? Our newly certified teachers begin with Sandra Berman from Noble Middle School. <laughs> Annie Brinkley from Wrightsboro Elementary School. Trisha Christmas from College Park Elementary School. <laughs> Whitney Coonrat from New Hanover High School. <laughs> so, Savannah Craigle from Williams Elementary School. <laughs> Catherine Edmonds from New Hanover High School. Jessica Elliott from New Hanover High School. <laughs> Lee.
Lisa Gattuso from Holly Shelter Middle School. <laughs> Melissa George from New Hanover High School. Donald Hall from Eaton Elementary School. <laughs> Peter Hunt from Carolina Beach Elementary School. Lisa Klingensmith from Coddington Elementary School. Brandy Laney from Riceboro Elementary School. Jeremy Milligan from Holly Shelter Middle School. <laughs> Janine Romero from Forest Hills Global Elementary School. Caitlin Rosander from Sunset Park. <laughs> Christine Sawyer from Bradley Creek Elementary School. Amy Steelman from Murray Middle School. <laughs> Sarah Veet from Williston Middle School. Mallory Weeks from Wrightsboro Elementary School. Virginia Wheeler from Wrightsboro Elementary School. Mary White couldn't be with us tonight, but she's a teacher at Parsley Elementary School. And Cheryl Williams from Williston Middle School. Now this next group of teachers have renewed their National Board certification this year. And they begin with Stephanie Bedard, lead teacher, English Language Arts K-8. <laughs> Bri 
Brian Bishop, Isaac Bear Early College High School. Jennifer Boer, Alderman Elementary School. <laughs> Nancy Brewer, Winter Park Elementary School. Mr. Budd couldn't be with us tonight, but James Budd, the fourth from Hoggard High School. <laughs> Teresa Conley, J.C. Rowe Center. <laughs> Sarah Gould, Ogden Elementary School. Pamela Jones, Williams Elementary School. <laughs> Jessica Mazaglia, Noble Middle School. Couldn't be here with us tonight. Kimberly, or Kimberly O'Rourke, Bradley Creek Elementary School. <laughs> Jennifer Raspit, Hoggard High School. <laughs> April Schnatterly, Rolling Grice Middle School. Jordan's here. Jordan Steinhilber, Murrayville Elementary School. <laughs> Jessica Taylor, Blair Elementary School. And Melinda Wiggins, Wrightsboro Elementary School. <laughs> Thank you for, you do, for what you do to the students in New Hanover County and what you've earned. Thank you. Everybody, come on up and get your picture made. See how many people we can crowd up here. Babies are welcome. <laughs> oh, I put the baby in the front. <laughs> okay. You get you Tommy takes care of you. <laughs> Governor School next. Yeah, Governor School. Now that we've honored some of our top teachers, we will honor some of our top students. 26 of our students, in fact, have been selected to attend the 2018 session of the very prestigious 
Governor's School of North Carolina. So Governor's School students, as I say your name, would you please come forward and remain standing for a photograph. From Ashley High School, John Mallon, who will be studying natural science. John? <laughs> Joseph Wentz was unable to attend tonight. Diana Winner will study choral music. Diana. Mark Fatum will study instrumental music. Mark? <laughs> From Hoggard High School, Dana Bumbalo will study social science. Dana, are you here? Rachel Collins, choral music. <laughs> Ellie Joplin cannot be here this evening. Michaela Parnell will study social science. Michaela. Anna Taylor and Fletcher Williams could not be here this evening. Mallory Suttoth will study dance. It's Mallory here. Okay, from Isaac Bear, Early College High School. Hannah Azizi will study math. Hannah. <laughs> From Laney High School, Emma Bowman will study dance. Is Emma here this evening? Guacdemo Galindo, social science. <laughs> James Risley, choral music. Andy Roylance, Natural Science. Andy. <laughs> Kendall Scott, Math. Lily Coyman, instrumental music. Is Lily here? There she is. <laughs> From New Hanover High School, Alyssa Boyette will study mathematics. Jack Kansico will study instrumental music. <laughs> Theory Ledbetter, instrumental music. Shuttlecotty, Natural Science. <laughs> Lynn.
Lily Smith, instrumental music. Grace Tippett, dance. Edwin West, natural science. I bet we know his grandfather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> From Wilmington Early College High School, Maya Palanza, natural science. And if the parents of these great students are here this evening, would you please stand so that we can commend you for your outstanding students. Sure, our chairman would like our governor's school students, would you please come up for a group photograph so we can celebrate you one more time. Congratulations, students. One more, one more. One more recognition. And our last recognition this evening is very special. Recently, the Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration Committee held an essay contest for students in New Hanover County to honor the legacy of Dr. King and the fact that he was scheduled to appear here in Wilmington on the day that he was assassinated. The MLK committee received hundreds of entries, and we're so proud of each of our students in New Hanover County Schools who took the time to reflect on what the legacy of Dr. King means to them. This evening, we will recognize the top winners of that MLK contest. So students, if you're here with us this evening, when I call your name, would you please come forward and remain standing for a group picture? Our first winner is in the kindergarten through second grade category. And she is a fabulous second grade student at Snipes Academy, and she is Miss Mackenzie Nelson. <laughs> In the third through fifth grade category, this student is a fifth grader at Alderman Elementary, and she is Madeline Leva. And finally, in our high school category, we have a junior from Hoggard High School, and he is Mr. Kenneth Marshall, Jr. If the families of these great students would stand, we would like to recognize you. <laughs> Mr. Higgins is getting good at this. <laughs> Congratulations again.
That concludes our recognitions. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, they have regular calls. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we lost a few folks. All right, next item on our agenda is the call to the audience. Uh, I would remind you it's, each speaker is limited to three minutes. However, time does not permit dialogue between the board and the community. While the board welcomes <coughs> residents to share their views, the chairman retains the right to limit discussion on a particular topic when such comments become either slanderous or personal in nature. Now. Having said that, we have had five people to sign up, and I'm going to call them in order. Lisa Harris. Good evening. My name is Lisa Harris, and I'm here again tonight to talk to you all about school safety. I am representing a large group, safety group of parents called Protecting Our Port City Schools. As a parent myself, I am thrilled to hear of positive changes coming in our school system. Additional SROs, more school counselors and social workers, as well as mandatory lockdown drills are all encouraging steps in the right direction. We hope that you are still considering utilizing key card systems to lock down current open campuses. Tonight, I want to draw your attention to the need for a discreet way for students to see something, say something. These students that have spoken up and reported threats this school year have been teased, labeled snitches, and ostracized by their classmates. We need a system where a student can text a tip to a cell phone on their individual school campus. The school's SRO or designated administrator on campus will then receive and review these anonymous tips. This process would allow an immediate response to a tip. Students should not have to fear being labeled or excluded by peers for reporting threats or serious concerns. We have to protect those students who are brave enough to speak up. Costs would be minimal, as this suggested process would require just one cell phone for each county, middle school, and high school in our county. I am asking you all to support our students by supporting the implementation of an in-school text-a-tip program. Thank you for your time tonight and your attention to this important matter. Thank you. <laughs> Shannon uh, Tinsley. Tinsley. Good evening to you all and thank you for taking the time to listen. I wanted to speak before you tonight regarding school safety. In the wake of recent events within our nation's schools, I decided I wanted to become more involved in our own county schools to assist in finding solutions to the safety challenges that are present. I was fortunate enough to find a wonderful group of parents who have the same desires. We have been working together and individually on a multifaceted approach to safety solutions. Some solutions are easy to implement and low cost, such as signs on the doors instructing students not to open them for any individuals. Centralized cell phones at middle and high schools for administration or SROs to carry that can be utilized like text to tip Students can send safety concerns to this phone immediately. It allows the schools to stay current with our young adults' communication modes. Also creating a strong community amongst the student body, noticing those who are dining alone or struggling and in need of help. Kindness and respect are free. Giving some ownership and responsibility to our young and growing adults to help keep their school communities healthy, happy, and safe. Other suggestions are more expensive, such as the key card entry systems, campus cameras with monitoring, 3M film on doors and windows that increase entry time into a school, extra personnel for the SRO program and mental health initiatives. These are just some of the ideas we've been working on together. I encourage the board and our local government to bring the needs and costs of these initiatives to the public. There are many individuals, myself included, that would be happy to help donate financially to improve school safety. We all know that funds are not easy to come by and are not unlimited. These issues are all very important to me. I grew up in this school system and now have two small children in it as well. They are in elementary school and my son will be rising into middle school this coming year 
and I want to send my children to school with the confidence and knowledge that we as parents and a school system have utilized as many feasible options to make school campuses as secure as they can possibly be. I look forward to continuing our work together, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> John Norwood. Was it Harris or was that the other one? Oh. Oh, okay. Not the baseball bat. <laughs> but what I want to introduce is a product made by 3M. Okay? It is not bulletproof. The bullet will go through it. It'll be the size and the caliber of the bullet. Our thing is to keep people out not to get in. This is a deterrent. It'll take somebody probably almost two minutes to get through this. And as you can see, this has been hit a number of times. All you need is time. That's the big issue. If you've got two minutes from somebody trying to get through that door, that's a long two minutes. That's where a resource officer can be there, first responders are on their way. And those are the things. And it's, it's a cost, a need versus cost, I understand that. If you're looking at bulletproof glass, you're looking at redoing the entire framing system of your windows in all your schools. This film goes on the existing glass. You don't have to change a thing. And it gives them that critical time to, just like FEMA says, an actor shooting training is run, hide, and fight. This is going to give them the time to do that. And I would certainly hope that you'll take some time to look at some of the videos that I've sent. You can go on YouTube, look under 3M safety and security films. It's used by the military and throughout law enforcement. And I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I've left some information for you all up there in, a, in folders. If you'd like to see a demonstration on your own, please let me know, and I'll be happy to provide that for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brooks Stanley. Her name again. Brooks Stanley. Good evening, and thank you guys for having me here tonight. I am a senior at Ashley High School. My name is Brooks Stanley. You can pull that microphone up a little bit more. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so I would like to talk to you guys about implementing music education in the special needs curriculum. One, for one, I would like to take a second to talk to you guys about a program called United Sound that takes place under the conductor of Jessica Embry at my high school. What we do as students in the music education department in the orchestra, we actually work with the special needs children as peer mentors to teach them how to play music, and they are our new musicians. So I would like to go into how this would be beneficial for both the students who are being able to obtain the education through music, and as well as the, stu the students who will be participating and helping them achieve their goals of learning how to play music. For one, it improves their speech and communication skills. Specific music used for special needs offers an effective way to develop verbal skills. For instance, music educators would be able to compose their own music to give to the special needs children for them to be able to have their own way to conduct and to play the music at their own pace. It also, and for communication, it gives the ability, the ability to effectively communicate and interact with others and gives children a healthy, positive outlet for their feelings. Next, it improves their cognitive development. Music, playing music is a multi-sensory experience. Making mu with that, it means music engages almost, almost every neurological system in your brain. When creating any form of music, it engages the tactile learning systems in your brain that involve touching the music, feeling, and, uh, and listening to the sounds and the vibrations that are coming from the instrument that they are playing. It also involves many of the cortexes involved in the brain, such as the sensory, auditory, visual, motor, and prefrontal. Just listening to music activates wide networks in the brain, and for special needs children to have the opportunity to play music will 
have a very high expanse on what they will be able to do and achieve in their lives. Last but not least, it has a profound effect on the confidence in their self-awareness. Using music for special needs children offers a way to positively motivate behavior by communicating non-verbally through the sounds that their instruments are producing. For instance, if a child or somebody is playing a drum, hits the beat of a drum, it will then prompt the child to make a request to play the instrument, as in, I want, the, I want to play the instrument. For social interaction in a small or large group, music is an invaluable tool. It teaches them how to take turns, how to listen and respond to others, and how to completely participate in an activity. As I was speaking about United Sound, we are having a concert where the special needs children will be playing with us side by side on May 21st at 7 p.m. at the Minnie Evans Art Center at Ashley High School, and I would love for you guys to be able to come and attend that concert. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Brooks, Brooks, would you be um, able to email us that date and time? I have it. You do? OK, I'll thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Ann York. Good evening. Um, I'm Ann York. I am a member of the NAACP New Hanover County Parents Council. And um, we are going to be starting to come on a regular basis to let you know about accomplishments in the community, also uh, events that are going on, and talk about a bit about concerns that we have from time to time. And the first thing I wanted to tell you, I was here uh, about six months ago to tell you about our AXO program, and Lisa was helpful in that. Um, we, AXO is like a uh, Olympics of the mind for students of African descent. It's for high school students. And it's been going on for 40 years throughout the country, and we just started participating last year. So this year, uh, last year we had four students competing in six categories uh, in Baltimore. This year we have um, seven students competing in 12 categories. And so we're growing and we're very excited about this. We have students represented from Laney, from uh, early Wilmington Early College, Isaac Bear Early College, Cape Fear Academy, and um, New Hanover County or New Hanover High School. So that's exciting and we hope that y'all will support and maybe recognize these students in the future. We would love that and I'll be happy to provide you with their names. Um, okay, so that's the first thing is AXO. The second thing I w is an event that I wanted to let y'all know about. Um, on May 17th, which is the anniversary of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, um, and also because this year in March uh, was the death of Linda Brown who brought that suit. Um, we are going to be having a commemorative uh, like 15 minute uh, kind of ceremony and that's going to take place Thursday, May 17th at our parents council meeting. We meet once a month that time at 907 Castle Street at the Link Center at 630. So anybody who would like to come to that, the Brown versus Board, we would love to um, see you there. And then uh, finally, I, I'm not going to get into this today, but one of the concerns that we are looking into right now is the high level of suspensions of um, elementary students from um, failing school and, and middle schools of failing schools here that earned DRF on the report cards. And um, some of the facts so far, we just received the 2016-17 information, but 90, um, the, the suspensions, for example, at Snipes Elementary was 90, to 90 times that of Carolina Beach Elementary. And Williston Middle School was over six times that of Murray Middle. And those are just some examples. The statistics are pretty grim. And so we are going to be working on that, and we'll be coming and speaking with you about that in the future. So thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda, administrative personnel, administrative contract renewal, Appendix A, Dr. Markley. 
There are no new administrators, but this is the annual renewal time for administrative contracts, so I would ask the board's approval. Do I hear a motion? What was the motion again? Move for, I would request approval of the administrative contracts. Okay. Administrative contracts. Right. I can do these by category or I can do them as a group. So moved. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Do we have any discussion? I don't know we can discuss much because this is personnel, but, well, these are on the open agenda, so. Any questions or anything? Hearing none, all those in favor saying the pop saying aye. 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 Any opposed? They are approved. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is a Head Start report <coughs> from Mr. Shell. Head Start. For the benefit of the audience, Head Start is a program that New Hanover County administers, uh, funded by the federal government. Uh, an item we took over that's getting ready to start our fifth year at Dorothy B. Johnson Pre-K. We have uh, uh, Rachel Greer, the principal of that uh, program, and Shannon Smiles here with us tonight in case you have questions that I can't answer. Uh, uh, they do a, an extraordinary job there. You have two items before you. You have um, the liaison report, which I report on to you uh, each month. And it talks about demographics, which we know we have 263 and four-year-old children there uh, from, from different walks. Um, but some of the highlights that we have here um, Last week we had a health field day, right, Mrs. Greer? Um, uh, wasn't able to attend. Um, and then in uh, May we're going to have a self-assessment. And you know, whenever you have a program, the public's always wondering about how is it evaluated and how is it assessed. And this is uh, this is extraordinary in my view of what they do and how they do it and how they're accountable to the public. Um, classrooms have been attending leading to reading uh, at the Children's Museum on Tuesdays. Work on Wilmington Beautification Project is scheduled. And the Creative Fair with early childhood education students from UNCW was a big success last week, the week before last. Um, we are uh, approaching the end of our grant year. Uh, with this, and with that, that'll lead us into the expenditure report, which you see each month. For the public, the seven board members are fiduciaries that make financial and policy decisions with a governing body made up of, of parents and, and et cetera, um, and it works together uh, to be successful. And we have to account for the money that we receive and the money that we spend uh, in uh, certain categories. We do that and we're audited by the federal government. Um, the organization has done an extraordinary job. We are, <clears throat> um, this report goes through March, which is 11 of 12 months. So we're 92% through the year. We've spent 88% of our funds, our total budget, $1.977 million. Um, there are uh, some reallocations that will be done between this report and the next, and we'll clear that up with you next month. But um, I'm here to say that uh, it is going well, and um, unless there are any questions from the board. I have one question. Yes, sir. One question. On the professional and technical development, I note that you've only spent 46% of the allocated money. Uh, and I think professional development is a key to quality education. Uh, can I 
find out whether or not there's, there's more plans for <coughs> April or what the status of this is? That's, that's uh, beyond my level of knowledge, but we got the expert here, so thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Um, as you know from being our former Head Start liaison, we do have set aside PA20 funds also, um, and that's close to $27,000 that we allocate towards our professional development. So what you're seeing tonight um, are our contracts, and we also have some contracts that are still have some open POs, so we're looking at closing those. This is for the month of March. So we will be at full expenditures for our contracts and our pr professional development. So we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And now for Mrs. Greer. So Mr. Shell um, wanted to know from the children's perspective what they love about school. And as they are wrapping up dinner time and preparing for bedtime, they let me come share with you what they love about school. You will find in front of you um, original artwork from our uh, four-year-old classroom, Miss Deemer and Miss Wilson's room. And they have varied input. Although Serenity and Alexis did agree, they love to play. Diana would like you to know that she can play with her friends, and that is why she loves school. Kylie would like you to know that she has friends and class pets. Samira would like you to know that she likes to learn about animals when she goes outside. Peyton says we see airplanes on the playground. Christian wants you to know that he loves school because they picked pumpkins. But Zamaya added that then they made pumpkin volcanoes in the courtyard. Brian loves taking field trips. Kingston loves to learn in dramatic play. Stephen would like to highlight that the big kids from DC Virgo played music for us. And Domineer wraps it up with, everything we learn is cool. <laughs> Tyon also drew pictures of how he likes books. It is awesome to hear that in addition to the numbers and letters, they walk away with solid foundations for their pre-academics. You can hear remnants of social emotional development, community building, science inquiry, gross motor development, experiential learning, and career readiness in their answers through the lens of the four-year-old. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Next item on our agenda is for information, beginning with Restart School Presentation, Appendix D, LaShawn Smith. Good evening. Um, New Hamry County Schools is in a very unique position in that we are um, able to relaunch both Snipes Academy of Arts and Design and Rachel Freeman School of Engineering as restart schools. Restart schools um, are unique in that they are one of the four reform models that have been made available to districts in North Carolina. And what this means for us and what it means for these two schools as they will have as is that they will have similar flexibility that flexibilities that are available to charter schools. So we're very excited about that. Um, so this evening we have with us the principals of both schools. We have Miss Rachel Manning 
um, and also Ms. Susan Sellers. Um, and Ms. Manning, as you know, is principal of Snipes Academy of Arts and Design, and Ms. Sellers is principal of Rachel Freeman School of Engineering. And they're going to come forward and share with you their vision for the restart of these schools. Good evening. Thank you very much for having us here this evening. Um, like Dr. Smith said, we are very excited about this opportunity and everything that's going to present our schools, our students, and our families. If we can get it to go. There we go. Um, the first thing we'd like to share with you tonight is our vision for our restart model. The purpose of this is to break the cycle of low achievement by implementing a deep and fundamental changes to the way our school operates. This um, model gives us the opportunity to be able to do that. We are working to shift the focus of um, Snipes Academy and Rachel Freeman to one of more of an academic focus that intentionally integrates our magnet focuses, our school being the arts focus and with Rachel Freeman being the engineering focus. And we've also spent a lot of time um, talking to our stakeholders, receiving their input, and we'll be using that and implementing all of that current input from our stakeholders, using their knowledge and their skills and everything that they bring to the table in order to help us craft and redesign this level of school improvement. Part of one of the things that we get to do with this restart model is um, calendar <coughs> flexibility, and I believe there's a calendar being provided to you this evening that shows some of that flexibility. This is just a summary of what you'll see in that calendar. It is still a year-round calendar. It's modified somewhat, but still meets the, what we call the definition of year-round calendar. There are 180 instructional days for students. There are six designated professional development and planning days for staff. These days, the students are not in school attendance, and it will be a full day of professional development and planning. Um, this is something that our schools and our staffs and um, both schools have expressed a need for. There still will be two weeks of extended learning and intercession for our students, one be offered in the fall, one in the spring, similar to what we do now. And this eliminates early release or half days for students. This calendar has a half a day or an early release on the last day of school. Um, in our schools, the early release days have just proven not to be very productive. At this time, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sellers, and she's going to talk to you about our professional development plan moving into next school year. So the calendar flexibility that Rachel just spoke of um, with those six full days of professional development and planning um, is something like she said that our teachers are, are very eager for. We do professional development now. Um, sometimes it's during 30 minute PLCs during the day. You can only dig into so much information in 30 minutes or a half day that has been built into our calendars year after year after year, which you've seen. Um, the calendar that you'll see tonight will take those half days um, and turn them into whole days for um, our teachers. So they have that time to sit and absorb and um, reflect on the PD and then have the time to plan how to implement what they've just learned when they go back um, to class the next day. So we're excited about that time. Um, so you know what PD is and, and we've always done it, but one of the um, new things for Restart that we're very excited about is the research of John Hattie. Um, we're excited to partner with his Visible Learning Network. And so this slide just tells you lots of big numbers that he's involved in. It began as a, a synthesis of 800 meta-analysis of 50,000 research studies involving more than 150 million students. It has grown into, as the second bullet says, 1,400 meta-analysis, 93,000 studies involving more than 250 million students. So basically what John Hattie does is he researches the research and then lets you know what works. Um, and obviously we're interested in what works. This next slide um, gives you a little bit more uh, insight and information as to how he organizes his um, studies. He categorizes the findings into six areas, um, which is the first six boxes going across. Um, things about students like prior knowledge, their backgrounds, their beliefs and attitudes about education, their motivation, physical factors like gender, sleep, nutrition, things like that. He's got studies um, on, or he's studied studies about those kinds of things. Home, 
things like family structure, if it's a two-parent home, a single-parent home, a grandparent-led home, um, parental involvement, socioeconomic status, curricula, uh, what instructional programs are the schools using for their phonics, the reading, math, science. Teacher um, areas, things like their subject knowledge, their expectations of students, their relationships, the effectiveness of BT programs, um, PD programs, teaching and learning approaches, cooperative learning versus inquiry-based versus direct instruction, how important is technology, what impact does tutoring have, those types of things. And then school and classroom conditions like the leadership, the school climate, diversity, ability grouping, behavior management. Um, so there's a link at the bottom of this slide uh, if you want to go and see the 250 plus areas that he has listed. And then he calculates an effect size for each of these areas and what effect does it have? Is it good for students? Is it bad for students? How good is it? How bad is it? So we looked at this extensive, exhaustive um, list <laughs> and um, we selected the two areas that are circled in red to be um, the two that we tackle next year that we're very excited about. You know, there were some on the list that we don't have any control over. There were some of the, on the list that didn't work. We definitely don't want to replicate those. There are some on the list we're already doing um, so these are the two that we selected uh, to begin with for next school year. This is another visual of kind of the same thing. Um, the hinge point, according to um, John Hattie, is any effect size greater than 0.4. So obviously we're not going to be interested in anything that's on the other, the left-hand side of that. And you'll see where the two that we did select fall. Um, effective feedback has 0.73 positive effect size and teacher clarity has 0.75 um, positive effect size. So what do those two things even mean? Um, and we're doing bits and pieces of each of these things already, but there are things that we could definitely um, get better at and more consistent at um, and just have a higher uh, impact for our schools personally. So effective feedback is teachers adjusting their teaching based upon assessments. Well, data-driven instruction is something you've heard for a long, long time, and so we do it, um, but we could be better. Students self-assessing and setting goals. Um, elementary students can do that. I don't know that we always expect them to and hold them responsible for that, but them having a little bit of that ownership. Uh, delivering the feedback in increments, making sure it's very immediate and very specific. Good job doesn't help anybody improve. A check on the top of a paper doesn't help anybody improve. They need to know um, what about it could, could make it better. Um, focusing on the task and not the learner. Um, errors are safe and welcome. Uh, we've studied error analysis through some learning focus PD that we've already had. A kid gets a math problem wrong, they don't learn anything by a red X on their paper. Um, they need to know exactly what step they missed. Did they get the first two steps right and then it goes south? The teacher has to analyze where they messed up, show the kid where they messed up, and then correct it from there. So error analysis, um, what they misunderstand and closing that uh, learning gap. <coughs> teacher clarity, narrowing the focus, answering specific questions like what do I need to teach? What do I not need to teach? The standard course of study, our common core, is still miles and miles and miles wide and deep and all of that. And some are need to know and some are nice to know and some are power standards that are gonna help you on the test, help you in the next grade level, help you in life. So helping teachers dig into their curriculum and decide what are the most important things that they master. If they can't master it all, what are the most important things? Um, and then how do they go about teaching it and how do they measure student success. So we're excited about the calendar flexibility that allows for those extended full length six PD professional uh, development days um, to dig into this and, and the positive uh, impact that we feel it'll have on our schools. So Rachel's going to talk now about some additional flexibilities that Restart will afford us. Yes. Two slides. Two slides. When we slides. got back from six areas. One, two, yes. Right. Uh, I understand that you were trying to focus in on the real high important things. Yes. Uh, teacher clarity and effective feedback. But I would just like to ask, because I've always felt like parental engagement was key to successful students. That if, you, if parents are not involved in a student's education, mm -hmm. then 
no matter how much money we throw at them, how much opportunity we give, what happens in the school is only about half of learning. And I think even the uh, North Carolina Educational Association even talks about students learning at home and stuff. So I, I'm just interested in how y'all are or are not approaching parental engagement. Uh, and we are definitely approaching it, and it's something that we feel is important as well, and we live with day in and day out. Um, and there are definite challenges um, with, with that. Uh, we don't let those challenges keep us from continuing to try to have parent events. Um, parents um, in, in my community, I don't want to speak necessarily for yours, um, we've come a long way in their comfort level in coming to school sometimes if they didn't have good experiences they don't necessarily feel comfortable coming to school you know we're we're authority figures um, that they may or may not have a have a like for um, depending on what their experience was like in school and a lot of them are very young as well um, so we've come a long way in relationship building and getting them to come for things they still come for non-threatening things like field day and STEM night and open house because their happy summer's over. Um, but when you have the parent universities and the parent academies about, you know, um, or EOG test prep at home and uh, promotion retention discussions and things like that, it's a little bit more intimidating for them. So it's a constant battle and we're continually looking for, you know, more and more ways to get them to come. And you know, everybody's always said you feed them or you get the kids to perform, we do that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the effect size is. If you click on that link, um, parental engagement is one of the things. And we didn't pick these two saying that none of the other ones are any good, right. um, but just the, the two that we felt like we would have the, some of the most control over and get the biggest bang for our buck out of. Um, and that doesn't mean to the exclusion of all of the other school improvement efforts that have been underway at our schools for, for several years. I for one would appreciate a discussion at some point in time about maybe what this Board of Education can do to reach out to, as I said, I, I think parents are probably the key to successful student engagement. And I would like anything that we could do, any thoughts you might have or you may be able to develop to say to this board, these are things that you as a Board of Education could do to help encourage parents to become more active and more involved in their children's education. And that's a discussion beyond just two schools. Yes. Well, I understand so that's that. something I'll ask Dr. Smith to, to work with us on, on putting together for a broader discussion. Well, but these were the two we're hearing from. I know. <laughs> Can you tell me uh, what exactly do the numbers on the bottom line mean? In research, you have what's called an effect size. If you go to the next slide, I think the, the, the that gives you a really good uh, picture. And that effect size says, uh, in research, it's a research term. So when you have an effect size, as you can see here, between right. 0.4 and 1.2, right. that has the most effect on what you're doing. So they've chosen two, two tasks for next year to focus on that give them an effect size that's 0.7. So it's a okay. research term. So okay. the closer, you, the higher that research effect size, the, the more impact it has on student learning. Thanks, I would have been here a week and wouldn't have known what it was. Additional flexibility that we are afforded because of this model, one is the budget flexibility. I mean, I've listed an example here um, that we are currently talking about and we'll be talking further with Mary Hazel about additional flexibility that we have. But one is um, the funding that's made available to the schools that's related to Read to Achieve and the summer camps. That money can be redirected to the schools for us to do things differently with it. It doesn't have to be mandated for that specific purpose underneath this model. Staffing flexibility, um, again, is important with this model. It provides us the flexibility to um, employ staff that may or may not have a teaching license if in terms of like aligning with our focus or a magnet focus. For example, at, at Snipes, um, you know, we have the arts, we have the dance, we have the theater, we have band, we have music. It may be that I need a new dance teacher and can't find a licensed dance teacher anywhere, but I have this great dance professional person that can come in and work with our students. So that flexibility is something that um, I hope I don't have to use next school year because I have an extremely strong enhancement team right now and don't want to lose any of them, but it is nice to know that this will give us flexibility in these hard to reach areas. 
So, you know, the restart journey, it begins. It didn't begin just tonight, and us talking about it with you is something that we've been working on all school year. This does give us a chance to look at things a little bit differently. And on this slide is, you know, the mottos for our two schools. Um, one of the things we've worked real hard on this year at my first year at Snipes is defining what is right. What does right look like at our school? Because we do what is right, not what is easy. Um, school improvement, there's nothing easy about school improvement. There's nothing easy about turning around a low-performing school. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. And I do feel very confident about the direction that we're heading in at Snipes Academy, and I look forward to being able to share those results with you as we continue to grow. And our, um, our school motto is Freeman Strong, the best is yet to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I've, I've got this. Anybody have any questions? Like I, I do. Uh, Ms. Chell has a question. Dr. Smith. Oh, okay. That's okay. Can, um, thank y'all. That's excellent. How did yes, you sir. choose this, and how did you get flexibility from the state? Yes. So, um, as I shared, the state affords districts um, the option to choose one of four models. Um, one is transformation. Um, the other is actually school closure, um, and um, the third model is, um, sorry, turnaround. And so with those, those other three models, of course, school closure means you simply close the school. With turnaround, you adopt <coughs> um, a specific improvement plan that's afforded to you more or less from the state, and then with transformation, it moves you into um, letting go of about 50% of your staff and then rehiring new staff. And then the, the other model is restart. And so with restart, the state um, promoted this as a way of saying to districts, um, and I, I will assume it's because districts were saying to the state, if we only had the flexibility that you afforded to charters, we could do this work too. And so the state made this model available to us. So if you remember in December, we brought forth to the board an application that outlined some of the things that the two principals shared with you this evening, and the board approved that. And so that application went to the State Board of Education and was approved by them. So the state of the staff, is that something you'll do this summer, or how does that work? So it does begin at the beginning of the year, and so you'll see the restart calendar that we will bring before you. We wanted you to have the information so that when you looked at the calendar, um, you would be well informed. Um, you will see that there are some additional um, work days at the front of that calendar. So that's when that professional development will begin. We believe very strongly that there are three pillars that need to be in place for effective school improvement, one of which is a strong, viable curriculum. And so we're working on that with these schools, and we've begun that work. The other piece is highly trained, highly qualified professionals. And though we've got some extremely strong teachers at this school, the children that come into their classrooms come with a variety of needs, and we want to make sure um, that those tool teachers have every tool that they need in their toolbox. And then the other piece to that is making sure that students are engaged in meaningful learning activities every day. And we think through this training model and the flexibility through Restart, we can assure that for both these schools. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? <coughs> well, thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is special education, vocational rehabilitation. Ms. Askew. Good evening. I want to introduce um, Betsy Stanwood. Um, she is our New Hanover County Schools Special Education Secondary Transition Specialist, which is a really long title, and Scott Crouch, our New Hanover County Vocational Rehab Counselor in Charge. Um, first of all, I want to start with, and then I'm going to let these absolute experts speak to you more about it, but I want to start with um, 
understanding the goal of New Hanover County Schools Special Education Department, and then also our partnering career technical education. So uh, first of all, the goal for New Hanover County Schools Special Education is to provide students differentiated research-based instruction that will support a successful transition to adult life. We start this message and this um, this service delivery when children with disabilities turn three years old. And we work with children with disabilities from three to 22 years old. So we know that it takes the, all of that time and there is no time to waste in preparing for a successful transition to an independent adult life. Um, our New Hanover County Schools Career Technical, ed Technical Education mission is empowering all students to be successful citizens, workers, and leaders in a global economy. Therefore, we of course want to work hand in hand with career and technical education. So it is essential to our community and especially our individuals with disabilities that we work hand in hand with vocational rehabilitation to, to braid all of these opportunities. They have, I'm gonna let um, Mr. Crouch talk about all the vocational rehabilitation mission and purpose, their charge. And I think you will see how it is essential for us to braid these resources together for maximum benefit for our students. So I'm gonna let them talk. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Yes. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I've got the touch. But any, anyway, I'd, I'd like to thank you. For over 40 years, uh, Vocational Rehabilitation has had a third-party agreement with New Hanover County Schools. So it really goes back to almost, um, I would assume, and I don't know this for sure, but back to the 1973 Rehab Act. Um, Julie had mentioned the, the mirror of our charge and our missions with special education and career technical education. And our mission, our purpose is to promote employment and independence with students with disabilities and help them transition from school to work. So we need to work together in order to make that happen. And like Julie said, braid not only the resources, but also the funding that we have. Um, a question was raised um, from a board member about number of students um, that we serve. This, today, um, we're serving 433 students. Last year we served 362, and the previous year we served 285. So we're continuing to increase the number of students we're serving. Um, at one point we had four counselors in New Hanover County Schools. Um, currently we have three counselors that serve all of the nine high schools. Um, a casework technician, a processing assistant, and then that's five people that are dedicated to New Hanover County Schools students, and then we have a vocational evaluator that serves New Hanover County Schools students, as well as a uh, business relations representative. Um, those clients are, are clients of vocational rehabilitation um, actually qualify based on their standards. So there's another piece to that that Scott will address as well that uh, allow vocational rehabilitation to reach out to some of our students who are not officially clients of VR through uh, workforce innovation. Yes, and that, that's the huge paradigm shift for vocational rehabilitation is the enactment of the Workforce Innovations Opportunity Act. Um, it was enacted in July of 2014. We're starting to catch up to it, um, which really is um, creates the opportunity to provide pre-employment transition services, of which there are five. Um, Self-advocacy, job readiness skills, uh, career exploration, work-based learning and options, counseling on options for the post-secondary education. Um, and that's huge because historically, vocational rehabilitation in the schools, the, mo the old real ta only tangible service that we provided was in school work adjustment, which on the graph, you'll see that we've spent um, last year, we spent over $18,000 um, with students in evaluating their work-based learning skills when they go off campus which is required for their education and their diploma. Um, so um, that's an opportunity that is really shifted everything with regards to our 
work in the schools with the schools and an opportunity for us to provide more services to students because we can work with 14 year olds now historically we started working with students their junior year now we can start working with students when they're 14 and we're talking about ways we can do that one of the ways is um, vocational rehabilitation has to, we didn't receive any new funding but we have to spend 15 percent of um, our current funding for pre-employment transition services <coughs> that equals to about 16 million dollars for North Carolina so we've put out requests for application and we have one contract currently in the Hanover County Schools the Arc of North Carolina is providing career exploration and job readiness skills um, there are two other contracts that are on the horizon um, one's going to serve all five of the pre-employment transition services um, and we're, there, we're talking about ways to do that, um, and hopefully that will happen. Um, and then there's another contract that's on the horizon working with our SDA students. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to increase um, the, the services that we can provide to students as well as to staff. Um, I also wanted to say in, in re relation to this, um, it's not indicative but um, or not illustrated on this graph, but we're big partners with uh, the New Hanover County Schools and their transition fair. Um, not only staff time, but also uh, financially. Um, we s provided almost $1,000. Doesn't sound like much, but um, $1,000 is um, substantial that you didn't have to pay out of pocket through pre-employment transition services that we provided for um, print costs and food. Um, we couldn't provide through policy any transportation that was incurred by New Hanover County Schools. Um, but that's another th way that we're partnering um, and the collaboration of which we have continued um, to do a lot of different things with regards to work-based learning, Fenner drives. And, and the one thing, and I'll let Betsy speak to it, well, I can speak to it because I'm doing all the talking. Um, but we're, we started, last year we came here um, and talked about doing internships within, within New Hanover County Schools. We're piloting that in two schools currently where a New Hanover County Schools student along with food and nutrition and the janitorial staff are providing intern, paid internships so we're paying the student to do an internship in food and nutrition and or janitorial depending on what their career interests are. And that's exciting to me because I think uh, the school system being one of the largest um, employers in New Hanover County, I think, and the, the different options that New Hanover County Schools presents to students to pr be provided some work-based ba learning skills. Um, I wanted to add about the transition fair. Um, we've had that for... Can you come up a little closer? Oh, sorry. Um, we've had the transition fair for seven years. This will be our eighth year. Last year we had over 600 um, people come through our fair, which every year it has grown. Um, we are now um, pretty much well known for that and have agencies begging and different post-secondary sites begging to come attend. Um, our families are coming through, um, so it's really a pretty big event. It helps our students, it helps our families in terms of accessing stuff, so vocational rehabilitation in that money that they spent, that basically paid for probably about 98% of our cost for the last two years, and all of that's money that they've been able to access through Workforce Innovations Act and the money that they are uh, dedicated to spending to support students. So not only are they supporting our students earlier and before their actual VR clients um, and coming into our schools and helping our staff deliver instruction but they are also supporting us in in this huge event that is really a, a critical piece of um, giving information to our parents last this year was the first year that we also had preschool um, agencies there so just reiterating what Julie was saying we are focusing on preschool all the way up to our post-secondary so we really appreciate the support that they give us and also that um, starting to talk about transition because transition happens throughout the lifespan um, but also I, students um, becoming more comfortable with their disabling condition being more open um, and talking about that um, oftentimes when I see a junior um, that has an IEP um, they don't have any disabling condition even though they have an IEP um, 
so that's a discussion that we have to have in order to help re the rehabilitation process with students. Sure. Um, we've just given you some examples on this next slide of some of the activities that we work on together. Um, the school survey is done annually and I actually send it out. We send it out to a large variety of staff that would um, have access to our students and students that may need support from vocational rehabilitation, including our 504 coordinators, our guidance counselors, our social workers, our special education staff, um, everybody that we can do across our, our career technical education, special populations and coordinators. So we try to get the information from them that's real basic on do they know about vocational rehabilitation, do they know how to access them, do they know the kinds of supports they can give, and we get information. We do ask for them to identify themselves in terms of their role and the school they're at so that when we get the information back, vocational rehabilitation can go through that and know if people need additional information or if they have questions or don't have the information they need, they can go directly to that person in our school and provide that to them and support them. This year we had our, we always send the survey out in February. This year we had a 47% response rate. <coughs> and if you're familiar with surveys, that's a pretty significant response rate. Um, usually you don't get more than about three or 4%. So we're very pleased that it was overall very positive and all the follow up that went on so that is something we've done, I think, maybe last five years, four or five years we've been doing that. So uh, a really good piece of information that we get from consumers, both for what uh, I do to support and what Scott does directly with vocational rehabilitation. Um, the only thing I wanted to say here was in, in terms of what we've got, Julie, it up and our time's almost up. We do have um, on our website uh, access to what was our transition wiki that we have posted that provides our staff and our and access for families for all kinds of information related to transition, access to vocational rehabilitation, uh, access to uh, transition assessments, our transition folders, everything. We are in the process of uh, switching over to a Google website so that that wiki may go down this summer but it'll come back up in the fall. Um, and we do want to invite you to come next year also to the transition fair, which will be on October 30th. So we're already planning that takes a year. Overall, we hope that you can see that the collaboration is really important for us to make sure that our parents understand the services that we have, that they understand the services that are available to their students, that they know how to access the resources, and we're hoping that through continued discussion in the schools, reaching out to them to ask for their feedback, that we can even tailor it more and more to what the different folks in our schools, the different staff need to understand for good referrals. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the work that happens between all of our VR staff and all of our special ed leadership staff and the teachers. Um, the fact that so many of our staff and so many of our students access the resources and the collaboration really just exponentially um, grows our opportunities for our students. So the links on here are in case you would like some um, reading after the meeting or during the meeting. We, we're not going to judge. Um, but basically gives a better idea of what transition services requires. It seems really simple. It could could not be more extensive and expansive. Um, and then any of the other information. And should you have further questions, feel free to ask. And I'm here every time, so uh, we, can, we can share more as you'd like. Thank you. Any, does anybody have any questions? Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is consensus items. Uh, personnel Appendix mm -hmm. E, Dr. Welch. Yeah, skip one. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. I, well, I didn't see anything. The superintendent's report. You got anything? Of course. Oh, okay. Well, it's not <laughs> written. That's, I'm sorry. A couple things on the superintendent's report. Folks, today is National Principals Day. So uh, hug your principal. They do an amazing job at their schools. Uh, leadership makes a difference and they make a difference every day in our schools. so I just want to take a moment to publicly thank all of our principals. Second, next week is Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, principals may lead the building but the toughest job is when you close a door and it's you and 30 students. Uh, 
and they do that every day. So next week during Teacher Appreciation Week, I would ask you uh, just say thank you to those teachers. If you had a favorite teacher growing up and you haven't, and, and find that person and give them a thanks. Uh, we all had that person who, who who made us uh, who we are. I have a fifth grade teacher, Miss Parham, who uh, I credit for, I think I learned everything in fifth grade and I just carried it with me for the rest of my life. Uh, you saw um, in the couple of things also from the, uh, just re on the public comment part, the Sheriff's Department has a program called Text a Tip already. Evident, we, it's obvious then that we've got to do a better job of advertising that to our students so they know that, that the anonymous service is out there. Uh, and with Rachel sitting here, we heard about suspension rates at Snipes. I will tell you, when you see next year's data, it will look amazingly different than it does this year. Since it is Principal's Day, I, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing that data when it comes at the end of the year. That's it. Okay. All right, now, next item, consensus items. Personnel, Appendix A, Dr. Wellmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Request the board approve the personnel matters as presented. Move for approval. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is approved. Next item, budget amendments, appendix F, Ms. Small. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I request the board's approval of the amendments as presented and just wanted to point out um, that most of the changes are related to state and federal um, revisions, but in capital outlay, we are requesting to transfer savings from the Gregory Roof Replacement Project and Veterans Park Roof um, Coating Project to the New Hanover um, Project with, with the remainder going into bond contingency. Do I hear a motion? Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, I do have one question, sure. and you may, maybe Mr. Anderson has to answer this. What roof is being worked on at New Hanover? We actually have that on the agenda tonight to award the contract oh. for Brogdon Hall. Okay. Want to borrow your old, you know how I am about roofs. I do. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a motion and a second on the transfer. <laughs> Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It is approved. Next item on consensus item, change of school assignments, Appendix G, Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. These are students whose parents have requested release to neighboring school districts where the parents are employed, and I recommend a release of these students. All right, do I hear a motion to approve this? So moved. I have a motion, do I hear a second? Second. I have a second. Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is approved. All right, now, we seem to have a fairly extensive old business and new business agenda, so um, I'm going to recommend we take about a five minute break. I mean, somewhere close to five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so we will stand down for five minutes. I do have one that was a card. 